Good afternoon. How are y'all? Good? Um, it's going to be a fun 30 minutes, let me just say that. Um, and you're going you're gonna to enjoy it, I'm pretty sure about this. So, where do I start? Data center innovation. Um, really, the way I want to look is really like this gentleman all day long, and I'm pretty sure you want to do this. Uh, and so, this is more the inspiration where we want to be when we talk about how the network is running. You really want to be in that position and saying, yep, everything is fine. So, a lot of the things you're going to see, what, I, what I'm going to talk about today and what I'm going to present, you're going to hear actually from some of our customers is around, how do we get to the state <laughs> that operating the data center is actually becoming easy um, and pleasant? And this is clearly a task that we need to do across what we're doing on the Nexus switching side, on the controller side, what we do with operations tools, uh, what we do around programmability and APIs to get to that state that it becomes seamless and easy to operate. So with that, um, come back to innovation. You know, innovation is kind of a funny word. Everybody loves to talk about it. Uh, and it's really not about just, oh, I have a cool new idea. It's really about, does the innovation help? Uh, to get you where you need to be to deliver the outcome. And so that's why what we picked here really is uh, a couple of topics to work through this. But before I dive in, uh, I just want to point back, you know, we have to, once a year, there's a lot of things that came out in the last six months from Cisco around data center innovation. I just put a couple of on here, whether this is around the ACI extension into Azure, that I don't know whether most of you know, we actually officially announced this in November and it's available. We did ship our first Fornicic switches, which is a little teaser, and I will talk more. And obviously, we do a lot of work on how do we do hybrid cloud and how do we operations around this. So lots of innovation happening. Again, all of this was to focus on how to make it easier to operate cloud infrastructure. So with that, um, let, me, let me set the seam a little bit, besides it needs to be easier. But there's a second very important piece uh, that needs to come together, which is really the infrastructure automation in itself is important, but it really needs to connect with the application automation in the front end. Because in the end, whatever we're going to deliver as a network service is driven by what the user in the data center, which is the app, needs to get done. And so what I want to talk about in the next couple of minutes is really how these things tie together. What we can do around connecting application automation with infrastructure automation. That's my number one. Number two is what we're doing to help you with the infrastructure automation, in particular the day two around analytics, to make this, instead of trying to figure out what uh, issue is where, to make this much, much easier to deal with. And then obviously, I'm going to end and talk a little bit about infrastructure itself to make sure you see where we're going on that end. Um, with that, let me dive in. Uh, how do we link? Application automation with infrastructure automation. And I picked some tools here. I'm not saying these are the only tools out there, but I stick, picked some tools. And really the buzzword that everybody talking about is infrastructure as code. And what I'm going to show is how do we these, use these tools that application developers typically have. And I'm pretty sure if you ask your application teams, they would say, yeah, of course. We use Terraform. Yes, we use Jenkins. And then he says, yeah, I use ACI. And how do we bring these together? And the idea really behind this infrastructure as code is that you can automate the whole stack from the application deployment to the infrastructure deployment. You can translate all the manual tasks in a piece of software and then execute the software. And you can rely on practices that are very, very well known for software developers and application developers, how they manage different versions of code, how they check in and check out code, and actually apply this to how to run the infrastructure. And you're probably looking at me and saying, wow, does Thomas say that I want you to all learn how to code? The answer is absolutely not. What I want you to work out of after this is to see how simple that actually can be when you use tools, actually when the app team uses the tools that they use today, and you actually can plug in with what we have as ACI and seamlessly integrate. And to show you this, I want to actually invite Lionel up to state stage. Please join me, Lionel. Uh, Lionel is a technical marketing engineer. Uh, he used to be out of Brussels, but we got lucky we moved him 
uh, to San Jose. But Lionel is going to work you through a little example how this whole workflow from the front to the back is actually working. Thank you, Thomas. So first, we have, as Thomas was saying, we need to have an app. So the first thing we have here is the app we are going to work with. It's a very simple app. It's a client and an application. The client needs to talk to the application for the business uh, reasons. And we want to have a zero trust policy. We want to limit as much as we can what it can talk to. So we are only allowing them to communicate with each other and to communicate with our application automation platforms, because we need to be able to manage it over time. The things to be able to do that, we are going to need a few tools, the tools that Thomas showed us. We are going to put them inside a workflow. We are going to build a whole pipeline. You will hear that word a lot in the, the CI-CD uh, world. We're going to build a pipeline of tools that are ingesting each other. We have here Terraform, GitLab, Jenkins, WebEx team. And then we have the infrastructure piece. We have the VMware, the ACI multi-site multi orchestrator, or ACI fabric, and your app. So let's start with the number one, the Terraform. So in infrastructure of code, I, have, I had to show you code, right? So here we have the HCL language, the ASHICorp configuration language, which allow you to define infrastructure as code for a whole bunch of elements. ACI is one of them. So in ACI, you can develop your EPGs, your, your whole configuration using that language. When you have written your language, you have to take version of them to be able to roll back and, and go forward. So that's where we go around GitLab and Git repositories, where we will commit our change locally and then push them to the central repository. That gives us one auditing, one element to manage. A good feature around GitLab or Git repositories is that every time somebody push code, it can trigger a workflow. And in this case, it can trigger the next step, which is Jenkins, our pipeline manager. Talking about Jenkins, Jenkins also has some code. So you can write your pipeline in JSON, which is itself not really code, but text files. And you can pull that in the same repository, because Jenkins can pull that file out of a repository and just use it. So you have one place of all your configuration for the pipeline, for the application, for everything, is that one repository. Every time you make a change, it triggers the whole pipeline. But the pipeline looks more like this when it's configured. It's a series of steps that Jenkins can measure every step, how long it took, did it go well, did it go wrong, and what happened. So for every one of those steps, you are going to get feedback from it. And feedback is quite important. That's why we have added into the systems a continuous feedback loop. We are using WebEx team to be able to do some, something that we call chat ops. We are using WebEx team as a feedback loop to users to see how the pipeline went. And if there is an issue, you, are, you receive a notification from WebEx team, and then you can go see your Jenkins. That's really part of it. Now the last part is the application itself, right? I have pushed the code, I have modified my, my infrastructure, and now I deploy my application. And my application itself is also very dynamic. Yeah. It's its own code. On, 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 that, on that note, right, so you just work through, I have this application to find, and we know these app developers, they want to change something. What happened? So if you want to change something, it's all code. So you just modify the code, push it back, and restart the whole pipeline. Everything is the same process which makes it very easy to just retrigger it, ah. retrigger it, retrigger it. Very cool, very cool. So, show how does it actually look? I think everybody in the room knows how ACI works, I hope at least. So how does it actually look? Yeah, so the important piece for ACI in this is that zero trust policy, right? So we want to isolate the different elements so that they, they can only talk to what on the ports they need. In ACI, we have that whitelist policy model, so we create groups, EPGs, which contain each of the elements, and then we define the only element they can talk to each other. So here you can see the three EPGs we, we are using in this element, the admin and the two uh, web and the uh, client. And then we are using contracts to say what they can talk to each other. Each of those elements contain the endpoints that we have defined. And, and you can see each of the endpoints. It, they can be container, bare metal, or any uh, different system. So it's really the system, uh, the complete application and zero trust because it's only supporting those ports that we have defined. So when you say zero trust, you really mean 
what I think most people think is like there's a whole segmentation done. Is that, is that really what this is? Yes. So they, can on, they are segmented in their own little zone, and they can only talk with the other ones on what you have defined that they can talk to. That is very amazing. Thank you. Thanks this a lot. This is a cool example. I really appreciate you walking us through. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Lionel. I, I, hope, I hope you took out of this, if, if you look at this, I really kind of take the tooling on the front and that your app development team has, describe what you want to do, and then just roll it in and, and deploy the infrastructure, the configuration that you need for the app automatically. And you literally can, as I said, as a code, and you saw Lionel showing this, you can roll and roll and update. The other good piece about it is, and we didn't show this here, the same will work if whether the application sits in your own data center on an ACI fabric or whether you extend this with ACI anywhere into Azure and AWS. It's the same thing. There's no difference. So that's the link between automation that your application team wants to do and the automation that you probably want to do on the infrastructure. So now let me come to the second piece. Let's assume you got this all done. You're happy that you automated the first part of your day. Now comes the second part and the next day and the next day. How do I make sure that I actually have a good stat on that my infrastructure is running as running how it should be? And so here's a set of tools that actually we had for a while with this assurance, and we're adding uh, something called the Network Insights Suite or Network Insights Capability to make it so much easier to really move from a more reactive to a proactive approach in monitoring the service of the infrastructure. And so what I want to do here is really um, give you a little glimpse. I don't expect you to actually see all the details, but this is like a GUI front end. It's a software extension that is built into your existing ACI AP controller and as well the DCNM for Nexus Fabrics. It's the first time you're going to see from us a set of tools that's the same. It works across both Nexus and ACI, and that's where we're going to go. It makes your life really, really easy because you can run it either for one or the other or both. It's the same look and feel. Um, one piece I do want to point out, and it's a little bit of a pride, everybody talks about telemetry, everybody talks about analytics. What is special here, what we can do is you see this, like you have a good view with Telemetry, the standard variety, garden variety one. What you really want is what I call better or advanced telemetry. You really actually see what you want to see, which is the ability to correlate flow information that goes to the switch with the status of the switch. That is something where you do need a sensor in the hardware, and then if you have a Nexus 9000, you have this for the last three years, you now can actually turn it on and actually put the amplifier there, and you're going to see it. So with that, uh, I do actually want to uh, introduce a good customer of ours, which is Bosch. Uh, and the reason why I want to introduce them, because they're a user of assurance. Um, Bosch, as you might know, German company. No coincidence, I'm German. No. Uh, leading global supplier of technology, 400,000 people worldwide, has different division, mobility, industrial technology, consumer goods, uh, energy and building technology. Uh, Bosch was looking for a data center solution that really helps them scale out and map better what they want to do from a business strategy with what they need to do uh, and what they need to do on the business strategy to map this to what they need to do on the technology side. And so with that, I do want to invite Jan Holtzman up on stage. Jan is with Bosch for 14 years. Uh, he is now responsible for designing, building, running Hello, Thomas. the network, the central network, and the global core. So thanks for joining me here, Jan. And let's talk a little about, um, yeah, we can actually just stand here. Yeah. Just talk a little bit about why did you pick, or why did Bosch actually, it was you at that point, why did you pick the Cisco Assurance product? What was the motivation? First of all, Thomas, thanks a lot for inviting me here on stage with you. So great question, why did we pick it? So this was for multiple reasons, to be honest. But the major important reason there is really for day two operations, we want to increase our efficiency in that area. Yeah. But let me elaborate a bit more on that one, what I really mean about it. We are now with ACI since around about three years in a productive state. And we had been very successful with that one. And the key for it was automation. We, immediately from day one, we invested in our automation tool suite. And the first part was really having zero-touch deployment scripts available so that we can spin off new ACI fabrics once RegenStack from the DC Optim was completed. On the second side, we also invested in a kind of framework 
with a front end, with a self service front end, which we handed over to our customers, to the server teams, to the storage teams. And with that self service framework, they leveraged our code to deploy all of the ACI configurations on the interfaces they required for the daily use. So earlier, they forwarded tickets to us with requests please do a configuration on the interface. And now, they are doing it whenever they require it on their own. So we had really been successful on that topic. Yeah. And we rolled out a lot of fabrics over the years and did a lot of migrations from Brownfield into the ACI, spinned up new environments for Greenfield topics. But when, it's, when getting more and more business in the data center, it also means that you need to deal with all the events in the EPIC. But on the other hand side, of course, also, we are doing that for business reasons. That's, that sounds really interesting. And I think what I really just picked up on is you did actually some of this front end automation to make it work with the infrastructure yeah. automation. So looking back, I think you were here two years ago when we actually came up with Assurance. Two years in, I know you have a bunch of fabrics. So what's the, what's the experience so far? Our experience is so far really good. So we have deployed around about 30 multipod fabrics around the globe, scaling from 20 leaves up to 400 leaves oh, right wow. now. Um, when we started now leveraging Network Assurance Engine for our own purpose and at this stage, we wanted to do this also very efficient. So we yep. leveraged the scheduler, which is integrated in the Network Assurance Engine, so we could attach multiple ACI fabrics to one single assurance engine. And that's for two different reasons. It's a great way. First of all, it reduces the amount of web frontends, the yep. consoles for our operation center. And on the second hand side, it also reduces the infrastructural cost because we only have to deploy it once. Oh, that's awesome. So this is already a great topic on that side. And on the other hand side, we now were able, we have a central network operation center at Bosch. And these guys are dealing with different types of technologies. Yep, yeah. They are not only there for the data center purpose, they do campus LAN, Wi-Fi, load balancing, and stuff like that. So they are now experts of each and every technology. We are now leveraging the ability of Network Assurance Engine that, and enable them to take over more and more responsibility within our day two operation business. And we already started to handing over the responsibility for day two operations and event handling for multiple fabrics to them. Sounds like, sounds like a real win. Of That's course it is. That's very interesting. And what I really like, once Germans are moving, they're moving. <laughs> <laughs> so, since I'm here and you're here, you know, that's a chance. So maybe like one comment, what are you looking for? Maybe what we could do more? Mm. What are some of the additional features? Okay, let me start with that one. I have seen the insights topic and I also watched it a bit on the world of solutions, what it can do basically. It looks pretty good from, from this perspective because it really closes the gap in the day two operations. Yeah. So far we are mainly looking a bit about the configuration compliance or the policy on this side. Now we are getting also tools for the data plane operations. And that's a great opportunity, and I think we'll have there a closer look in. Oh. But on the other hand side, one challenge back towards you. It's now really challenging. We have the APIC. We have Network Assurance Engine. We have Enhanced Endpoint Tracker. We are getting maybe insights. Yes. So we have a lot of different consoles, and we have a, one operation center. They deal with a huge number of consoles. So my flavor here would really be go in the integration way for a single pane of glass or something similar. That's great feedback, by the way. I can tell you the work is, in a, is underway. Maybe we're 12 months from here. Let's see where <laughs> we're going to go. Uh, you, will, you will see some good integration. We started off as Network Insights. You will see things coming together. Right, so, great. But Looking thanks forward. for the feedback. So maybe last, last sentence, if you like, look like two or three years ahead, where do you think this is going to go? Where should we go together on this? Oh, I have a dream, Thomas. <laughs> Let me tell you the story behind that dream. Um, it's a couple of years back, and I attended an early preview of Network Assurance Engine, yes. which was held by Tom Etzel. Uh. <laughs> and this was in the really good old times. The tool was still called Candid, and we yes. all, all of my team, they still Most like this old name. Most of you don't know this, probably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but the great story at this time was he presented the tool, how it is behaving. So having the policy on the one hand side, the configuration, yeah. the intent, having the fabric state, bringing this together, and it immediately was clear, basically, for me, it can become a game-changing technology if you're going in a direction of auto remediation, you can detect a fault, you could solve it automatically, yeah. and then that would be the dream basically because we were close to a self healing network and reducing the downtimes where the customer might not even recognize it. Okay, that sounds, sounds like we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, it's a challenge, so I know. I really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing, Jan. Great. Uh, look forward to work closely going forward with Bosch, and it's a beautiful partnership. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. 
So with that, automation on the application, infrastructure automation, data analytics. Now, you probably wonder if this is all good, but is Cisco keeping up with the infrastructure under the hood and modernized? The answer is of course. And I do not think that everybody of you needs 400 gig today, but for the 50 people I can count that needed, we have it. That was a joke. Uh, my last section. So we do invest in 400 gig. You actually see the pictures here. You actually can touch these boxes if you go down to the data center corner. Uh, again, I don't expect everybody to use 400 gig. What I do see is the need for building out an infrastructure that over time can get there. And as you might imagine, every 400 gig port can be used for 100 gig. So if you know that you're in the next one or two years or three years need to move there and you don't want to replace, you can actually build with confidence at this point. Um, these are standard Nexus 9000 switches. We have Nexus 3000 switches. You can extend the infrastructure you have today with the same capabilities you have today. Everything you just heard about, how we do automation, will work here the same way. But anyway, I don't want to go really into the switches itself. What I really want to do is actually bring one more customer on stage, which is OVH Cloud. So Alan, uh, join me here. Alan is the, and I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at the German pronouncing French, uh, <laughs> but Alain Fiocco is the Executive Vice President of Product and CTO of OVH Cloud. The quick thing I probably should do, OVH Cloud, French company, very, very impressive company. The third largest cloud hosting provider, you have like around 400,000 sure. service, which is a large number. And what is really interesting about it is a lot of your customers are startups, and you take them when they're young, when they need agility, and then they're growing. But maybe we're going to talk a little bit about what is OVH focusing on? Uh, I know it's the customer experience, and you're really not just looking at the data center, but the edge to the data center. Maybe you can explain a little bit why that is and you know, what are some of the considerations you sure. have there. So sure. thanks, thanks for inviting me first. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, at OVH uh, Cloud, what we do is uh, we provide hosting services for uh, VMs, bare metals, websites, what, what the traditional cloud uh, provider would do. But the thing that we are doing perhaps slightly differently from uh, anybody else is uh, we believe that the, um, the network is actually a complete integral part of the service. So first, we're not charging for traffic, neither ingress nor egress. So if you bring your workflow into a VH Cloud, you, you get access to the full capacity of your workflow without having any surprises when it comes to paying the bill, basically. But in order to do that, something that is very important is that we, we have deployed a massive uh, backbone. And this backbone is actually connected to peering points with no congestion point at any point in the network, which yep. means that you know, we have 20 terabits of capacity in the backbone, which exa equate exactly 20 terabits of peering points capacity, no congestion whatsoever, all the way up to your servers, and so you have access to the full capacity. That's 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 a very impressive approach, and you know, I know it's part of it is you want to you want to don't want to have spikes and then don't know what happens, or you don't want to have uh, DDoS attacks, which I know are very common yeah. in the hosting world. Great, so. That's your concept from the edge of the data center, but then what do you actually see happening in the data center? What is around bandwidth? I know when I first time came out, it was like one gig, and now I know we're more like, where are we going? Well, we, so 400,000 servers, as you can imagine, not every, not every one of them will be connected at super high speed. There are still <laughs> a, a lot of them that will be connected at relatively slow speed. However, at the top end of the line, uh, our bigger servers are actually going to be connected four times 25 gig uh, two times for public network, two times for private network, so that the customers can basically decide where he wants to, to right. manage that. Uh, that goes into a non-blocking multiple lanes of 100 gig fabric, um, which is going to evolve over time to 400 gig once we, we have the need for that. Uh, the next phase is going, in particular for storage, we're going to bring 50 gig, multiple times 50 gig to the servers and then yeah. 100 gig. Um, the place where we're going to deploy 400 gig is um, primarily in the backbone. We have multiple data centers yep. on the uh, US East Coast that we need to connect with much higher capacity than we do today. We have so many 100 gig lambdas that we need to groom that into 400 you need, gig. You get the big pipe. Exactly. Step after that is um, we have campuses where we have multiple data centers 
So the entire connect will be uh, 400 based, and then that will move into the fabric right. and so on and so forth. And so this is the interesting piece about it is because Alain has the, the Nexus 3400 in, which is like 400 gig capable, like 12.8T. But as I mentioned earlier, not anybody jumps to 400 gig. So yeah. really the idea was, can I get large scale 100 gig and have the option to go to 400, yeah, right? So, That's so, so we tested those works with 400 gig, obviously, but uh, yeah. the first deployment is actually happening right now. And uh, we're deploying 100, 128 uh, 100 gig yeah. interfaces on the fabric, right? So uh, that's, that's, that's the current deployment. That's very impressive. That's very impressive. So maybe uh, to close after this, uh, to close on this, so this is like the bandwidth story. Some other transmitted future of data centers, I know you have a lot of ideas there. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's bandwidth and it's services, right? Yeah. So, so what happened with the, um, when you operate an infrastructure like a mega scale provider, um, the, the real challenge is not so much bandwidth. Of course, you need to increase bandwidth uh, over time. But it's actually how do you deliver the services at those speeds, right? And continuously having to increase the capacity of delivering complex services, network services, at higher and higher and higher speed. Um, quite frankly, I mean, the cost is getting out of control, right? Yeah. Uh, if we continue to grow at that kind of speed, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to cope with those network services. So the, um, the future for us is going to be to disaggregate switching capacity with network services. And in order to do that, um, it's also going to, for us, is going to simplify dramatically the fabric, the network fabric. And we're going to have network services proxies or, or servers, if you wish, that will deliver the services to the customers. So in order to do that, a lot of ideas, but we're looking at yeah. having an IPv6 only fabric, uh, which we are deploying today already for certain customers, um, and using SRV6 to be able to send the traffic that requires additional services onto the farms right of servers. And by this way, we can actually have two different scales that will grow and progress at their own pace. Interesting. Very interesting concept. I think the reason. I'm so intrigued, besides obviously it's a successful growing company, which is awesome. Uh, it's a lot of interesting thinking through how to architect correctly, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we see this with a lot of other customers as well. How do I balance the need for bandwidth and where the service need to be, and how do I build actually really cost effective? Which kind of comes back to, in the end, how quick can I get the service up and running and be profitable? Yeah. With that, uh, thanks a lot. Thank I you. really appreciate the uh, joint partnership. And thanks for sharing today thanks so much. the OVH story. Thank thanks, you. Alan. Um, I hope you got a little bit of a sense uh, of all the uh, innovations we have cooking, we delivered. You got some uh, stories from our customers. And clearly, there's more to come. Uh, and I'm not going to be here and pull like the rabbits out of the pocket, so to speak. But there's more to come, right? There are some of the terms, I should put them up here, but that's cloud first. How do we help the networking team if they don't want to deploy the fabric on-prem and just try it on the cloud and then make it easier to port it back? There's things around ultra-low latency. You probably heard a little bit about this company uh, that we have around ultra-low latency NICs and switches. There's a whole story on SD1 and how we bring this together with ACI. Uh, there's edge computing. OEH is probably in that bucket and there are others that have capacity in the edge and how to build data center service there. And then clearly analytics. We brought out these application set. Jan made the comment, make this easy to consume. Uh, and one of a little glimpse, and this is just a teaser for you. You don't have it yet. But you probably saw this Intersight tool that runs as a SaaS. You can log in. Today you can manage your compute and your storage. Imagine there's a little tab popping up and there's networking as well. So that is just an idea what you probably should expect to come from us around analytics as SaaS, analytics as a simple integration. So with that, uh, I do want to say thank you for spending 30 minutes. Um, we're right in the demo floor, the show floor. I think this is a picture from last year, but it's the same thing. The data center demos are all in the corner if you go this way. Everything I talked about, all the products I mentioned, you can actually see and you can get more detail there. So really appreciate the time, and I will hand it back to Tony.